have a seat. Any particular order? Oh, you're standing. <laughs> Are we putting the um, bright lights off? Because <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, I'm going to hide behind the lectern because it's a nice safe place to be <laughs> when, you're, when you're chairing a panel. Um, so, for those of you that were hoping um, for an in-depth discussion regarding EVs, for example, or, or hydrogen-powered vehicles, uh, given the title of the, uh, of the uh, panel, Driving a Green Future, I'm afraid you're going to be really disappointed because that's not what we're going to be talking about. But what we will do uh, is to explore the aspects needed to drive activity towards net zero ambition. And I think we might see what's needed doesn't always relate directly to carbon. But rest assured, within those activities that we will cover, uh, there are opportunities to reduce emissions, contributing to a greener and more sustainable future. Uh, but first of all, introductions. Um, I'm David Brain. I work for RTC North. RTC North is a business support organisation that's based across the north of England. Um, and currently, I deliver on a programme uh, funded by Innovate UK called Business Growth, and we help small but ambitious, uh, innovative companies to bring new products to market and to enter new markets uh, and, and to internationalise. So I'm part of the business support community. Um, and now I'll introduce the, t the, uh, the panel that will help us navigate this, this discussion. Um, Elizabeth, can you give us a, a brief on your role, the organisation, and some basic activities that you undertake? Yep. So I'm Elizabeth Elliott from the Business Growth Hub. So I... I specifically focus on eco-innovation, so although we're a general business growth support organisation, I help businesses in Greater Manchester to grow by developing and commercialising new products, new technologies, new services, and particularly in the eco-space, which, in my opinion, every business should be doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm Victor Selwood. I'm from Siemens. I work within a consultancy business that works right across a sort of a spectrum, particularly focusing on energy but looking at how we can get all of these things playing together in an integrated sense, bringing in digitalization, bringing in innovation, bringing in collaboration. So there's so much more outreach than just necessarily trying to push products, push services and so forth. So uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Cool, Rachel. thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Shaw. I'm Head of Digital and Sustainability at Swiss Scott Textiles. We are a wholesale supplier of textiles predominantly into um, the laundry industry, which supplies hotels and hospitality, as well as building out our own sort of retail brand as well. Uh, I'm also a member of the Pro Manchester Green Committee. Um, so my role very much is looking at us as an SME in Manchester and working on measuring our carbon footprint and decarbonising our business. <coughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm David. Um, I'm standing in for Simon Turek, who should have been here today, so he sends his apologies. And if anyone did want to speak to him, please grab me afterwards and I can connect you to him. Um, so I'm here representing PNZ Group, Power Net Zero Group. Um, there's three parts to our business. Um, one is PNZ Consulting, so we advise and consult with organisations on um, how they can get to their net zero targets, uh, particularly around scopes one, two, and three. Um, we have PNZ Energy, which is an installation business, so we install solar, uh, solar heat pumps, and then PNZ Carbon, which is the, sort of the focus for today. Um, PNZ Carbon is um, basically helping the UK transition to net zero through um, retrofitting homes um, funded by um, the demand for commercial localised carbon credits. That's great. Thank you, David, and, and thank you for stepping in at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, it's that last minute. I haven't even changed the names on, on my script sheet here. So <laughs> if I occasionally call you Simon, Simon I apologise in advance. Okay, so we, we all need uh, a lead on something before we can invoke change. And the net zero challenge is massive and all pervading, as we know. So setting us all on a better path is easy, right? Yeah, we, can, uh, we know that governments uh, have got our best, best uh, um, needs in, in mind. Um, we know that uh, local authorities, they, they look after our home towns, so they clearly know what we need and, and, and will look after us. Um, and businesses surely understand a really good thing when they see it. Um, maybe not. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, I'm going to come to Victor first of all, because um, your area of expertise within sort of strategy development um, is really important in this role. And I'm just wondering, could you set us the scene uh, about high-level strategies that will reach all of us to help make a difference. And typically, 
what are the components um, of a good carbon reduction strategy, for example? Thank you, David. So, yeah, um, there is, it has to be said, from my view of the world, there is a lot of strategization going on. There are, despite what it might appear, good directions coming out of national government. There is a lot of very good work, obviously, being done at GMCA. I would say they're very much here in Manchester. Uh, Manchester is probably leading from that sort of local authority point of view and a number of the local authorities as well. And you see that wider field as well. So just to take the point that you're making there from the public sector point of view, yes, like with everything across the 300, 330 councils there are across the UK, there are laggards and there are sort of leaders. And I would certainly say that Manchester is one of those. So in terms of looking at what's the next step that I need to take, there is a lot of information, there's a lot of direction, there are a lot of good groups, and we've seen some of them already here today who can help and guide and signpost and flagship those strategies. Those strategies in and of themselves then give us that bigger picture. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize to the businesses and so on here is have that eye to that bigger picture because that's where those opportunities are. There are some massive opportunities across Manchester and the Northwest that perhaps with uh, reskilling, retooling, different process, different mindset, you can start to tap into. That's not necessarily the first step of all of those things, but it's one of the many opportunities. I think there's a lot of people who look and are worried and are, fear, are scared of what, what climate change could bring, all of the uncertainty that is inevitably out there. But actually, I would say very much the flip side. There are so many opportunities that can be unlocked. If we look at the sort of the action planning that that strategization uh, takes you forward on, then all of the things that you can do that, take, po uh, that, that uh, take you in a positive direction on saving carbon, on considering uh, improving the waste recycling and so on, can straight away help on the bottom line, but it help to grow and develop your business. So we talk about digitalization, understanding the business better, measuring, monitoring and controlling, and digitalization and the digital world and AI will of course help to unlock all of those things. So straight away, you can start to improve and find new opportunities and avenues for your business before you get really into, right now we know what we're doing or now we can see where we are. How do we then start that strategic journey to reduce and save and offset and so on? And that can then come through if you're measuring and monitoring through the behavior change, which is one of those first things, getting the right mindset across the organization, you know, the simple things we all know about, switching off lights, changing the forms of transport, can we move to public transport, and then all of the other efficiency measures that start to follow through as well. So a key message that I'm getting from that picture is that strategy is a very much a, a live business, and you need to start somewhere on that, and you start to feed that back into an information loop that you can then build upon that strategy yep. and, and, and improve its impact. That's great, thank you. And you did focus on there on, on business opportunities and, and, and bottom line importance. And um, Rachel, I'm going to come to you next. And uh, well, you'll know what it takes to engage both your internal business, but also your suppliers and customers. Um, after all, they are your biggest scope three uh, issues that you've got to tackle. Um, so. What overall strategy have you adopted as a small to medium enterprise? Yeah, so I literally joined the company one year ago this month. So in one year, I've kind of come in and had to start from ground zero and look at how we sort of move things forward. So you know, we've touched on it before, but having been a business in GM, you're know, benefiting from support from the, the green economy, starting to educate yourself around like your data and your climate footprint is, is the first bit. So that bit, what Victor's saying, I like data is once you've got that visibility and understanding, it helps you to then see those hotspots and those largest areas. And collaboration for me is the key bit at the moment. So we're involved in a number of different industry associations. And at the moment, I think understandably, everyone's still just trying to get their own house in order, like measuring their scope one and two. So an example for us is we supply the laundry industry, which is actually one of the class as one of the top five energy intensive industries in the UK, uh, 2.5 terawatts of energy a year is used in obviously you know, the heating, washing, drying of, um, you know, we stay in hotels, we go to leisure clubs, you know, it's a hidden industry that people don't see the actual impact. So for that energy to, de that industry to decarbonize its amount of energy that it's using is a huge investment and change for that industry. So understandably, those business owners are very much right now focused on their actual energy bills, but the products that we supply into those markets and then the scope three, which I think so many people 
talk about it, but they don't know what their own business is scope three is, and they don't understand, therefore, the products and services that they're buying are also part of that chain. So at the moment, we're just trying to have more conversations and collaboration just to help get groups of people together to look at opportunities where we can work across our supply chain. So one example of that being um, you, you, there's an initiative called Better Cotton where you can actually source cotton that is grown in a more sustainable way. At the moment, that comes at a premium. Our customers don't want to pay that premium, and then their end customers currently aren't asking for it and prepared to that, change that premium. So what's really exciting in facing into those challenges is looking at getting people in your industry together beyond you know, just your immediate um, customer base and starting to try and agitate and encourage adopting new ways of working that will be in everyone's interest, but it's getting that kind of collective buy-in because you can't just operate as one entity by yourself to start to instigate and drive some of this change. So that's one of the ways that before we can even start supplying that product in more, we need to get buy-in downstream to actually recognize the value of what we're trying to put into the market. That's fab. And what I'm hearing from that, so the key element of that is about education, engagement, and communication, both internally and externally with your customers and your suppliers. Yeah, and even just getting, so at the moment, we're talking about the impact of uh, Greater Manchester as a region, playing on that kind of textiles heritage, three or four of the UK's largest suppliers of textiles into the industry are all based in GM. And there's already one company um, who's been on the journey to net zero course where we've actually started to have conversations about, let's share our scope three data. Let's start to try and create a consistent model with some of the numbers that we're putting in. Because otherwise, when we're talking about materials, it's not about gaming it or having any one company having an advantage. It's about being more kind of honest. And I think at the point where, you know, we want to work together on driving up the standards around some of the kind of ways that we can improve material sourcing, mm -hmm. then there's something to be said for banding together and having a united front as a supplier into an industry to try and encourage more, more sort of sustainable procurement. Okay, if, if I could ask as well, are there opportunities as you're looking either up, sorry, I always get confused between downstream and yeah. upstream, <laughs> but as, as you say, you've got a very clear product and definition but looking into the processes of your customers, working with them collaboratively, then sharing that insight so that you can help them to use your products in a more efficient way as well. Yeah, and I think this is the bit, I suppose I feel like I'm always like waving the flag now for like SME businesses that provide <laughs> physical products because there's a lot of other associated supporting <clears throat> services that can help businesses to go on that journey. So if anything, we supply a material, but that material is in process by machinery. <laughs> Bang on 11. I presume that's the lot. Yeah. <laughs> <Come again. laughs> oh, goodness. One more time. Okay. Did we get an extra minute? I believe we'll edit those out, but anyway. Um, I'll be honest, that completely threw my chain of thought. What was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was so listening out for the messages, everything else went out of my head. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, we were on the, the, the need for, yeah. for collaboration and business support, uh, which segues very nicely, uh, if I can come to Elizabeth now. Um, obviously, um, support to help businesses to navigate the net zero agenda and tackle those sustainability issues, as well as create new businesses uh, and new business opportunities is complex, but that's why we've got people like uh, Growth Hub and the, the, the role that I undertake, um, and also a rapidly growing ecosystem. Um, Elizabeth, perhaps you could shed some light on, on some of the typical challenges that you see in the SME sector and how those elements are supported by organisations like, like yourselves. Yeah, I think um, actually there was a slide from Steve earlier that explained it quite well. The first word was inspire, but I think I'd also translate that into educate. So first bit is understanding the problem and being inspired to change. So of course, the green economy team do a lot of work on that journey to net zero and things like that. So you're understanding your carbon footprint to start with, um, because 
the famous phrase, you can't manage what you can't measure, then we've got to get people to actually commit to innovating. So that's time spent thinking about what you can do differently and also investing money in it. So, um, I mean, we do help with that as well. We have innovation vouchers to help people um, sort of contribute a little bit of money to help them do those innovations, bring them to market. And also remembering that innovation isn't, I think Amy alluded to it earlier, is not inventing the next rocket ship that's going to go to Mars. It's about looking at what you're doing in your business and actually doing something new. So innovation is all about the new and how can that impact your carbon footprint. So carbon credits are great in a lot of ways and I love the uh, model that you're doing at PNZ with the retrofitting locally because the community, community benefits are brilliant. But also you need to look internally at the business. How can you make your products and services and technologies more sustainable? And also we help and support people to understand the commercial benefits of that. So it's not just a cost. There's lots of opportunities out there. If you can create a new service in your business, you're tying in customers for longer. You're getting the making the relationship better. Um, you know, you've got more loyal customers. Actually, a, lot, a really hard part for SMEs is going out on sales and marketing to getting new business. Well, all the effort you put in, if you can keep those customers for longer, you can make them advocate for your business. That is worth the investment in my opinion so innovation in business models in design in, in extending product life cycles in creating service models all these things are things that hopefully we are supporting businesses to do and you know we work with some of the same clients and um, so we support them through one-to-one -one support we have workshops we have as i said innovation vouchers everybody loves a bit of money um, you know if i had a pound for every business that asked me for some money for something um, I wouldn't be sat here, I'd be on my Caribbean island. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's all these things that we can bring together and also collaboration. So helping people to businesses to work with the universities that we've got in GM and in the UK. GM has an amazing university network. Everything they're doing, Manchester, Salford, the energy house has already been mentioned. MMU, we've got amazing technology, amazing facilities, amazing expertise, like global world-class expertise so let's use it it's very difficult for businesses by themselves smes particularly to bridge that gap between academic expertise and the business world so we help to do that that's part of what we do and um, so yeah there's loads of help out there green economy business growth hub the innovation team please do reach out and look for us because we really want to help people to innovate and we want to help people to do that in a net zero direction there is not such thing as just a green business anymore. Every business has to achieve net zero. So net zero cuts across everything now. And um, so eco innovation, in my opinion, cuts across everything now. Fantastic uh, advert. And, and actually really good support as well for the, the panel that went before that demonstrates, <coughs> excuse me, that demonstrates how, even though you may have a great idea, you do need that support, that ecosystem to actually take a product to market to make sure that you've got all the standards sewn up um, you know, uh, and that you can approach the right market in the right, right way at the right time. And it's great to hear, obviously, as well, that they can feed something back into, into the social side of things, which we may touch on later. Um, one of the elements of support, obviously, is, is technical signposting. Um, and you know, I'm going to lead into to, to David here and, and what, what PNZ have, have, have done is quite unique. Um, obviously technical solutions uh, such as access to renewable energy or carbon saving measures uh, require funding. Uh, they do provide a payback, obviously, but I'm intrigued to know how PNZ, PNZ have approached this in a unique way to help companies access the funding to pay for the investment required uh, and what closed loop and really quite uh, innovative and, I, and I'm really interested in this one myself. Yeah. Uh, how you've managed to bring that, that to the market. So, so I can't take any credit for it. It's Simon's um, methodology that he created, but he, you know, he created this methodology over, I think, a three to five year period. Um, and it is the only methodology in, in the world that exists today for uh, basically um, taking the decarbonization of housing stock, so it's particularly focused on housing stock, uh, and taking um, the uh, emission reductions from there and then turning those into carbon credits. Um, and then the demand for these credits come from commercial organizations who you know have these net zero targets but ultimately um, in trying to get to those targets on their own is near on impossible so they need to look to other ways to, to reach those targets and one way is through 
um, is through buying carbon credits. Um, and and the, the nice thing about the methodology that PNZ have created is it is a closed loop system. So essentially, the, the funds from the carbon credits uh, are channeled back into retrofitting homes in the UK. And these are typically homes that are in fuel poverty, uh, people who can't afford to heat their homes. Um, so therefore, the retrofit works are done. Um, then, then the carbon savings from those homes are then turned into credits. Uh, and, and the cycle sort of continues. Um, what's really nice about it, it's a sort of really localized model as well. So, um, you know, there are other projects out there where, you know, they'll say, buy credits and we'll plant a tree in Zimbabwe or something like that. So, you know, you've no idea the tree's been planted. Um, you can't see it. There's no data to support it. This is obviously very data driven, very visible, localized impact. So for organizations who want to reinvest in the local community, you know, and have their ESG targets as well as the net zero targets, mm -hmm. this is a great way for them to invest in the local communities because they can, you know, you can literally go and see the house and see that the solar is on the walls, there's sort of heat pumps being fitted, um, you know, because there, there is a real um, uh, challenge in the UK in terms of the number of homes that need to be retrofitted. Um, it's about 19 million homes that need to be retrofitted at a cost of 250 billion. Um, there just isn't the government money there to, to, to achieve that. Um, so it does need private capital. Um, so this is a, um, a really nice proposition where you know, organizations can achieve the net zero targets um, and they can invest in the local communities. And obviously then we can sort of attack this challenge of, of retrofitting all the homes in the UK that we need to do. And ultimately then these homes are warmer. So there's a social value impact there as well in terms of um, you know, um, people not you know, sitting at home in blankets, freezing cold. You know, they're living in warmer homes, which makes them more productive. It means they go to work. Um, children go to school, do their homework in the warmth. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique uh, offering. And it's, it's, the, the beginning of the, it's the very beginning of its journey. So obviously, you know, part of us doing things like today is to raise the awareness of what we do. Um, you know, we're looking to talk to local authorities um, around their housing stock and also obviously corporate organisations as well who are looking to invest in, 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 in their net zero journey. Uh, if I can just emphasise, uh, um, in the strategic work that we've been doing across Manchester and the North West, when we look at the sort of the transformational change that will get us to 2038 through all of the big things that we've heard earlier around carbon and, uh, sorry, carbon capture, hydrogen uh, economy and all of the rest of it, third in terms of the decarbonisation potential is exactly that market. So it can't be emphasised enough. We all ultimately live in homes. We all know that the housing stock in the UK, particularly compared to a number of other countries, has not just the new build and the brownfield, but the retrofit challenge. So it's a huge market. And again, pushing back into that supply chain, if there are products and services that you've got that with little effort and some support from people like, uh, you know, the uh, B Net Zero, the Green Company and so on, uh, for, for me, it, it, that's probably the very first place that I would target. May I just add a little bit of something? So what PNZ are doing is really innovative and it's not, it's about the, actually about the business model. So I don't know if anyone else went to, uh, or saw the um, Vital Topics lecture at University of Manchester recently, Paul Omrad was talking about the economics of levelling up. And actually one of the quotes in there that I really liked was, innovation is going to be the strongest driver of levelling up. So market forces are actually quite weak and it's really innovation. So that is a localised thing for Greater Manchester and the North West in general. And I know we hear a lot about levelling up and maybe we're a bit disenchanted, but that is really key. So innovation, not just leaving it to the market, that is really important. And that is what businesses like PNZ and Swisscott they are contributing to that levelling up effort through that innovation effort. There is a huge north-south divide as well in terms of the progress being made. Um, so the north is lagging behind. So again, I think as a greater Manchester community, we really need to drive forward in, in, in way, any way we can to, to make sure that we're not left behind. But again, from what I've been seeing as well, greater Manchester in terms of the GMCA are extremely driven around uh, this sort of thing. So when we were studying this, um, the biggest driver when we were looking at the Northwest as a whole was Greater Manchester Council and they were throwing data at us, the analysis and so on. So there are definitely the links and the drivers coming through yourselves and out into the sector. It's a, it's a no brainer. Yeah, that's fantastic. And thank you for, for further contribution to, to that particular uh, strand. But coming back to, to higher level strategic action, both at a regional and, and at corporate levels, Combining the principles of carbon reduction and the need for constant growth in our, in our economies and development, 
appear to present us with a bit of a paradox. You know, we're, we're, we're looking to save carbon, but we also want to grow and enhance and, 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 and bring further economic development. So that paradox is also going to put pressure on the public purse um, as well as the public one. Victor, you know, in terms of strategies, how do we, how do we wrestle with that? How do we, how do we find, find peace uh, amongst that paradox? Um, essentially, it, I mean, it, it, the, the fact is the change needs to happen at all levels. And, and as we've seen on some of the discussions uh, this morning, the great keynote which said, this is the change. I'll volunteer around the uh, lack of sex side of things just to help with my particular <laughs> carbon footprint. Um, but there are the far, wider, um, the, the far wider opportunities all the way up to that global vision that both we should be getting from central government, we're certainly getting from more on a regional basis, and again, the leaders within, uh, within the local authorities. But it's all part of an ecosystem. So yes, I, I would love to tell you all about how wonderful Siemens is, how big we are, how great, how all we do are so many different things. But our recognition is as well that we can't do this without collaboration, without partnerships, mm. without investing. And so recognizing that, we work out and reach out with the green company. We reach out all sorts of areas in terms of innovation, research, working in with the universities, uh, and anywhere and everywhere, and the SMEs as well through our supply chain. So again, that's one of the big drivers that we've taken is not just to say, right, well, obviously scope three is the biggest issue for Siemens supply chain or Siemens coming from the supply chain perspective. We're looking to work out and help our partners, our supply chain to green, greenify, and therefore it becomes that good sort of virtuous circle. And particularly, I think from where I'm looking at strategically, one of the big gaps that it's great to hear being picked up is around waste and, and really creating that circular economy. And I'd love to talk about some of the things that I'm finding there, but I um, appreciate we're tight on time. No, well, we'll see if we've got time for that. Um, also, I guess there's the, 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 the replacement of the old, the dirtier technologies uh, with new opportunities. And I was at the launch of the Centre for Excellence in Advanced Materials and Sustainability uh, the other week, which was a fascinating opportunity to bring new tech into existing materials you know, Manchester is well known for its textiles uh, uh, history um, and we have the opportunity to, to continue on that innovative journey which was pretty much the founding uh, principles of, of Manchester um, that we can continue to develop new products and services that have a much lower impact. Um, Elizabeth, obviously um, access to that, that technology, better understanding, approaches to new design, all that sort of um, potential out there that companies may not be aware of they're the sorts of services that, that um, uh, you can help them uh, become aware of through the growth hub. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of what we're doing at the moment is, I'm glad you've mentioned the circular economy because <laughs> that's a, a lot of what we're working on now with businesses. I think a little bit people just don't understand the circular economy. It's not good understanding around the language at the moment. It is not um, doing things because you've got the bleeding heart and you just want to do good. That is good, but it's also about those commercial opportunities that I mentioned before. So we're talking to businesses about how to make things more circular, how to keep product life cycles um, longer, how to make them longer, how to, um, what you usually find when you're doing that journey is that you need to, the design phase is the most important. So you need to put that design effort in. I think there's a quote that everyone uses that design has 80% of the impact on that sort of product um, calm footprint or environmental footprint that you want to, um, that you're measuring so we're helping businesses with those understand those models how to introduce them to the business how to introduce eco design how to think about that um, and that's a really big part of the educational piece for businesses but we need businesses to accept that and come on that journey and see it as a commercial opportunity and not just a cost because it's the right thing to do it's got to come from the right place and you mentioned growth you can grow your business through these innovative models and um, without creating huge forms of carbon and um, i'm sure rachel has a lot of experience in that take make waste um, side of things in the textiles industry i also came from the textiles industry yeah. i've seen how big a problem it is Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm going to <laughs> stop talking, so I'll go back to David. My planning clearly got well into this last night, and then <laughs> we've actually run out of time, which is a great shame because we've got so much more to cover. So all I can do at this point in time is say, grab us at the break, <laughs> explore some of these ideas further. Um, I'm really interested to explore much further um, the, the, 
the closed loop funding and provision of carbon capture, carbon reduction opportunities that, that your uh, business model uh, presents at, at PNZ. Uh, um, look to these guys for further support, look to your colleagues and your supply chains for, for collaborative opportunities and to progress on this journey together. So hopefully, um, we didn't get any time for questions and I've got half, half the agenda left to go, but hopefully we've, be, we've been able to inspire, uh, to demonstrate how investing is important and more importantly, how to practice innovation uh, amongst your peers. So if you put your hands together and just thank the uh, contribution for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, that was that was a brilliant panel. I was so fascinating, and uh, Elizabeth.